to this month's episode of Understanding Film through the Penyon Public Library. Um, today we're going to be talking about a personal favorite of mine uh, who, you know, luckily ended up on uh, one of our free websites that we like to make sure everyone has access to. We're going to be talking about After the Storm by Koreeda Hirokazu. Uh, he's a Japanese director currently working. Um, I know we've been, been talking about a lot of contemporary filmmakers this uh, year, but Koreeda is um, quite prolific, you know, about a film every two years, and they're all kind of masterpieces. So we're going to break down uh, what makes a Koreeda film kind of work, uh, specific to what we're going to talk about very briefly, the auteur theory. I think we've talked about it a bit, uh, but I want to make sure you have a couple ideas, like when we talked about Wuja films, etc. And then we'll use sort of After the Storm as an example. Um, you know, Koreeda is a really interesting uh, director to think about for the auteur theory because he doesn't have, as we'll see, like a very um, vivid style in terms of, you know, a Quentin Tarantino or a Wong Kar Wai uh, filmmakers who have a very clear way their films look. When you see these kind of auteuristic films, you, you can't mistake it for anything else. Koreeda is not really like that. Um, it's a very precise, very subtle look. So if you've watched a lot of his films, you'll kind of get used to what a Koreeda frame looks like, and we'll see some of those coming up. Um, but he kind of fits under the auteur theory for the other reasons that you would apply to um, a director. Right, and in, in film you know, criticism or, or film thinking, the auteur theory, um, which comes out of France, obviously, from the way that I'm butchering the pronunciation, but also just the look of the word. Um, you know, 1960s is kind of when we start seeing, you know, early, you know, Cahiers du Cinema uh, critics. That's the publication that really got, you know, film as an art form. They're thinking about a director who is more than just a title, more than just an organizer of a production. It's sort of the author, the creative force, and the, the, the consistent creative force behind a number of films. Um, so, you know, today we have a lot of filmmakers who make um, many fine films. Uh, but a filmmaker sort of like a Steven Spielberg, uh, to some degree, a Michael Bay, wouldn't really fit in there under this. Um, maybe Michael Bay, actually, but uh, even if you're not a fan of, of these directors, some directors like Spielberg make excellent films, technically superb, but they don't necessarily have the qualities we're about to talk about, um, especially over time. And so the author theory is thinking about how this type of director is the creative mind or voice behind a film. Sometimes it's the director like Corieta, who writes, directs, produces, and edits all of all of those things at the same time. M. Night Shyamalan kind of comes to mind too in that way. Um, but also, let's say it's just a director who doesn't do all those things, but everybody on the set, everybody in the production is doing just what that director wants as opposed to a more, um, I don't know, corporate uh, arrangement. Uh, and has sort of these common visual elements. And if it's not a specific style, it's gonna be some specific visual motifs, which we'll talk about the Coriata. Certainly very common ideas, common plot ideas, common character types. Um, and you'll see that as we uh, recap some of Coriata's earlier films. And definitely themes. Uh, and what's important about sort of the idea that we are exploring the same theme, the sort of same universal truth is that some uh, authors like, um, Sofia Coppola is a great example. A lot of her early films uh, were set in the present day, like um, uh, Lost in Translation, but a recent film like uh, The Beguiled, which is set in the Civil War period, has many of the same ideas. And it actually does look a little bit different from some of their other films because the themes are very similar. You can transpose an author's vision into a different genre or a different time period, and we maintain um, that, that sort of personal stamp, that creative vision and maybe a stable cast of actors too, uh, is always helpful. Uh, you know, if, if you're looking very carefully, you'll see some very familiar faces throughout the, the movie posters. I don't know everybody's name, all the actors' names, so I'm not gonna try that, but um, oftentimes an author, you know, Coen Brothers uh, are some of the other folks that come to mind that we've seen. Wes Anderson will have some of the same actors, um, and that's part of also the visual as much as comfort level uh, that these directors wanna work with over a period of time. So uh, for Koreeda, probably the film that comes to mind the most is the film Shoplifters. This was uh, not only uh, the winner of the Golden Palm at Cannes when it came out that year, but also it was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film. I think it won for Best Foreign Language Film uh, a couple of years ago at the Oscars. And this is about a family who 
um, you know, we should be doing this all the time, but they sort of have a, a, a seemingly unconventional definition of family. They're not uh, related necessarily all by blood. They're related by experience. They're related by their social economic status, really. They're all sort of um, hustling and scrapping it out to try to make ends meet, living in this one house uh, with this older woman who's the mother of this man. This young girl shows up in the film. Um, she kind of comes out of nowhere. They don't know who she is and they welcome her in. But we'll see that that's sort of like um, the family dynamic and also the character that's coming from outside uh, by surprise or maybe by twist, plot twist, it's part of Corriere's view. Um, our little sister, uh, one of my personal favorites by him, um, about three older women who have a younger sister kind of show up out of nowhere. So uh, we're starting to develop some motifs here. And like father, like son is about two groups. Uh, notably, here's this father here, same actor over here. Uh, but these two groups, these two families, who it turns out these two young children were swapped at birth by accident at a hospital. So they've been raising each other's children. Um, uh, and they decide how they want to do that. Yeah, right here. Apple TV. No, 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 you don't have to pay. It's free somewhere else. Stop. You sure? Yes. This is free too. Yeah. It's free. It well, welcome everybody. Um, and so, you know, this idea of sort of like plot twists with family dynamics with a specific look, that's a Coriata special. Uh, however, some of his films don't quite fit into that mold in terms of the plot twist. And that's not what After the Storm is, if you've seen it. Still Walking is another good example of a creative film that's more just a straight, elegant family drama. Um, it is about a family who every year are, are remembering someone who's passed. And there's sort of a little bit of a plot twist there. Um, but Still Walking, uh, the Criterion Collection did pick up for one of their releases. It's a bit more like After the Storm, which is going to be a more traditional family dynamic. Uh, Abe Hiroshi, so when we talk about After the Storm, though, we'll start talking about some images here. Um, you know, it's the film, very basically, uh, about a, a man who won an award for a novel some years ago and is now struggling to sort of get his second novel out. Uh, he's working as a private detective in a detective firm, um, and now he's estranged from his wife. And, uh, and she's now dating, she's finding other uh, partners. Uh, she's also been sort of consistently dating uh, men of, of a higher economic status than uh, who Abe Hiroshi plays. Um, and they share a young child who we'll see later in between. So they're, they're strange, but they, they sort of spend time. Um, certainly uh, Abe Hiroshi's character is trying to spend more time with his son, but obviously his, um, his legacy of sort of uh, struggling with gambling addiction, as well as just you know, the inability to sort of consummate that next creative project is kind of holding him back. And his mom uh, or his ex-wife is trying to move forward. But sort of the real linchpin is also um, the grandmother who, or A. Hiroshi's character's mom, who, you know, A, uh, this wonderful performer is in almost all of Koreeda's films. She was in Shoplifters. Um, and she, you know, is this character that binds them together in this apartment, which we're gonna explore quite a bit. Um, sort of her apartment is the locus point of the plot. Uh, she loves bringing people into her apartment to kind of make them feel welcome, make them feel happy. Um, but also she's dealing with her own sense of loneliness. Uh, the film begins with her husband having passed and kind of working through the will and, and uh, both of her children, Abe Hiroshi's character and his sister are kind of like stealing stuff out of the apartment to sell, uh, sort of little trinkets here and there. Uh, but we'll see that she, in much of Coriata's film, is always kind of an emotional uh, North Star uh, within the family and it's often the elder. And we'll see that plays out even if um, their, their space is quite constrained, the emotional reach is quite extensive. Um, so one thing to consider is that in creative films, there's often a hyper detail paid to um, interiors and also very constrained spaces. Uh, so we're gonna give you some, some great examples uh, coming up sort of breaking down a couple of shots, a couple of sequences. But early on in the film, we see um, to the extent that, you know, it's hard to find privacy, which is also part of Coriata's both um, maybe themes, but characters struggling with that, but also the way that his camera and his storytelling becomes very, very close to the characters. We really understand over two hours so much about them that sometimes you miss. So in this moment where Abe Hiroshi's character is trying to take a call, he, there's nowhere to take a private call in this tiny apartment. So he's sort of like curled up in a ball over to the corner. 
And this sequence here, I think it's a nice one. So we see lots of shots like this in Correa's um, compositions, very tight, very cluttered, smaller apartments in many of his films. Um, I think never more so than after the storm. It does a great job. So we have also this lateral composition because we can see Bay Piroshi through the window there uh, and the grandmother and the mother. Uh, but we also see sort of all the different objects in the foreground, some things in the background, and then even to sort of push into space, we can see the trees and the power lines. Um, sometimes also space is so constraining. And I think, you know, Corriere probably likes A. Piroshi because he looks very distinctive, but also he's very tall. And so you can play with sort of the architecture and the, the casual and normal space within these kind of um, stereotypical, but sort of normal uh, Japanese apartments that he loves to explore. So there he is sort of dodging under this door frame. And sometimes Corriere even sort of pushes things so that um, even in this shot, we see a character um, crouching and looking into the storage area, but we lose the head. And so sometimes we get the sense that the spaces are so constraining that we lose part of the character. Um, I like this sequence here where, um, you know, sometimes within shots, we get a sense of how uh, space is very cramped. Here, uh, the main character is talking to a sister. And she's right. She's sitting at a table, and there's a fridge behind her. And the, the mother, the grandmother, is coming up to the fridge. She has to lean forward as the door comes open. Like that's how tight the apartment is. Um, that you know she can't be sitting at her chair in the same position because the door to the fridge opens. Right? Imagine this. Uh, if this was the situation you're in, maybe it is a situation you're in. Um, but in, I also love though the fact that his sister kind of just understands. She doesn't look back. She just knows if I hear mom behind me and she opens the fridge, I'm going to have to lean forward. And this is another way that Corriere sort of explores our relationship to space in terms of how we get used to things and how we sort of become almost innate individuals. She's living in a whole different house. She has a whole different family now as a grown woman, but she still remembers all these sort of patterns that you have to inhabit as you live in these spaces. Um, we also see, so it's not just this one apartment, of course, we have a nice uh, range of locations in After the Storm, and in this, this reoccurring pawn shop, right, A. Piroshi's character keeps taking stuff out and trying to pawn it so he can pay alimony. Uh, we have this sort of tight, uh, cramped space both below and above of the, the pawnbroker. Uh, we also have some really neat, um, uh, you know, not cramped because we're in different spaces, but uh, great internal shots, uh, a bit more, frankly, variety than you often get in Creator. He often has that one location, that one house, shoplifters, three little sisters, uh, the apartment, like father, like son, and here with After the Storm. This film does get a little bit wider. So this is the interior of the private detective office where he works, but you can see kind of the same, um, uh, attention to detail Corita does, and I like this shot too because of all the lines. Um, there, there's the lines, there's the DVDs, there's these files, there's a lot of like line energy in this space. We kind of get an echo of that at this love hotel. Again, some part of his work is, is tracking people, trying to find who's cheating on who for the client. And we see here sort of um, the striation in the section here, right, a giant teddy bear for sure, but the cubes. So sort of line compositions, even though um, we've sort of broken out of the traditional uh, design of a Japanese home, though that's sometimes part of Corriere's design. We see it kind of transposed in these different locations. Again, all interiors. And this is sort of the hyper messy. Uh, this is a, a, a comic book uh, office, a manga office, where Abe Hiroshi's character is sitting here kind of trying to find some kind of work so we can, of course, pay the alimony. But even in this kind of really busy sequence, we have lots of vertical lines from the books to the binder um, to just sort of the alignment of people. And then, uh, you know, to get as busy as possible, we have the sequence later in the film at this um, uh, gambling sort of mini casino. And so we get this nice range in this film, which I think is why also I like um, thinking about After the Storm, uh, this and maybe uh, the third man, his sort of little dabbling and um, murder mystery. It was kind of a weird film he put out like right before Shoplifters, so not a lot of people saw it. Um, but he really kind of expands the scope, even after we're always pretty much inside in this film, except for some key moments I'll talk about at the end. One way though to think about, you know, so, so we have the wide sweep of all these different interesting internal locations. Um, we have sort of a very intimate understanding of space, sometimes through very particular moments or sight, I don't know, not sight gags, but sort of like sight arrangements that are interesting. Uh, but this is the first shot of the film, and I think it really gives you a great sense of what Corriere can do with space. 
um, because much of what I've shown you is kind of just static images. He, his shots do take longer um, than many directors that maybe we're used to. Uh, but in this sequence, we see again the sister talking to the mother, the grandmother. And the shot, the film opens like this. Um, the sister is writing out some thank you letters and she's on the porch. And then it switches. And so it's the same space and it seems very tight. But what Coriate is so good at is even in tiny spaces, kind of finding the angles to really kind of expand our understanding. So we, we maintain the feeling of compression and tightness. Like this shot feels very cramped. This shot feels very cramped, yet they're totally different. And so we get these two different, very different angles and so without maybe having the camera wander through this tight space, we're getting these two and soon three or four shots that give us a sense of the entirety of the area. Uh, and we sort of continue that there. Now we get a close up, right? So instead of having, um, you know, these medium shots, right? You can't do a wide shot, the space is too small. Uh, we get a nice close up here, sort of zooming in on the mother, the grandmother. And then towards the end, we go outside. We go to that porch where we saw um, uh, the mother in the first part of the shot. And we go outside and we get to see sort of what this is like. It's a tiny little balcony. And yet Corieta takes us out there so we can see that space. Um, you know, just a few other references though. I think it's not simply so, you know, Corieta can really place us in a very tight, intimate place. It's also, I think, um, a sense of what we can do with uh, what we have. I don't want to say what we can do with less because, you know, that's a relative thing. And we see that um, the grandmother is especially caring with food. She's constantly pulling out these Tupperware containers. It's like an ongoing game. It's like, this is three months old. Should we be eating this? She's like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. Uh, but the idea being that, you know, you, you use what you have to the absolute most. And whether it's a small apartment or it's the food that we have and we use it to bring in family, even if the family in this point in time of the film is kind of fractured apart. We use it to bind things back together. In some ways, like a, a warm embrace, like a tight hug, these smaller spaces, this compactness is a good thing, uh, depending on how we want to perceive it. As so we see here, uh, she's playing at one of these three month old dinners. Um, you know, another really tight shot that kind of shows the clutter on his desk, but there is still sort of this order, this, this numerology he's keeping track of. He has stacked up very carefully his lottery tickets. He has the ink there for his writing, right, his aspiration, even if the papers are a bit of a jumble. Um, even sort of whimsical bits like this, right? So Corieta sometimes also uses, and in this scene, um, there's, they're trying to stay the night. We see this very tiny bathtub, which is, you know, fairly normal, but just the way that, you know, because he's such an outsized person physically and also uh, in some ways emotionally in this film, it's a tight fit, it's a tight squeeze. Um, and, you know, the way also that sometimes when you just pivot the camera, you can understand not just the space differently, but the family dynamic. In, uh, about in the middle of the film, we see again the sister, she's always right at this table, right? She likes being at this table. We turn the camera around and we're able to see some elements of her family too, kind of tucked away in the corner. And of course, not only do we see her husband and um, uh, Abe Hiroshi's sons or her nephew, we also get these nice photos here. So we kind of look, go from understanding the compactness uh, to sort of, sort of expanding out the familial space in this nice shot here. Again, to sort of the, the sense of sight gags, we also have a point where um, a Hiroshi, right, it's so tight in the, 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 uh, the balcony that he, he shares the window and this guy comes in to fix it up. Um, you know, he's happy to do it, right? The happy-go-lucky spirit that are in many of the side characters in, in curated films. Um, but, and this is just a great shot sort of the exterior of, of the detective uh, office where it works. But here's something to sort of think about, right? So a master at exploring um, interior spaces and sort of the particular modern sense of these kind of uh, cinder block apartments, uh, as much as the grand homes like you would have in uh, three, um, uh, Our Little Sister, uh, where you have this sort of large mansion that's embodying uh, the family, right? In some ways also the spaces for Corriere to kind of mimic the dynamics of the family and our little sister, the family is very expansive, very welcoming, uh, lots of energy, lots of dynamism. Here they all feel in their life quite compressed. And so Corriere is very smart in terms of how he uses his understanding of filming space to also match the characters. And yet we have many times where characters get to breathe. They go outside and they're with nature. 
And uh, some of his films kind of really dig into, you know, maybe there's a forest nearby or off in a cemetery is, is sort of a, a bucolic space like in Still Walking or uh, towards the end of Our Little Sister. But here's just this wooded area that's, that's sort of intertwined with these numerous apartment blocks and also uh, right next to it, right? This shot kind of juxtaposes. Two thirds of the shot is the cement uh, building and one third is the tree. Um, we get this, especially in our wide shots, the, to the extent that we get them, almost uh, always exterior shots, uh, right? So we can't really do wide shots in the apartments because they're very tight in this film. So we do, we want to balance things out. Corey understands the sense of balance. We get wide shots. Here's one, an aerial one looking down from the balcony. But we, again, we have these shrubs outside. Um, even in, you know, he loves these kind of back alleyways with the paint on the road. This is a very specific thing I see in almost every creative film, not just the crosswalk. There's always sort of the, the calligraphy. I'm not sure what it says. Uh, but again, trees kind of poking out. We, we might have a plant or two in an apartment, but almost never um, more than that because it's so small. But we always have sort of nature persisting in the outside sequences. Um, and here also, right, and this is partly a class distinction, we can see um, A. Piroshi's uh, ex-wife with her new boyfriend, right, he's got kind of that Brooks Brothers look going on. But here they are also out at a ball game. And notably, the first time he sees um, his, his rival, his romantic rival, this man, they're at this outdoor ball game. Here's his, uh, his son, who he's trying to stay connected with. But they're in this very sort of open, bucolic space uh, in juxtaposition to the tight, you know, cement spaces that he's used to living in or sort of the places he has to go as he investigates people. Just another quick point before we um, you know, tie back to sort of pull some threads together. Uh, every creative film has some trains in it. And I recognize, you know, a shot in Japan, urban spaces often have it, but it's like, it's eerie how often he wants trains to be in his films, almost an obsession to the level of like Kurosawa, also loved trains in the 60s, uh, but Kurieta loves trains. Um, of course, the beginning of the film, our main character is on a train, um, and here's a railroad crossing. And so there's just trains everywhere, um, I haven't found any interviews where it really talks about that, but I just feel like, you know, even if you got to the last five minutes, you know there's going to be a train in there if you haven't seen it yet, of one of his films. Uh, even in, in the one that was just shot in, um, in France, he, he made his first non-Japanese film this year. It wasn't very good, sadly, uh, but there were trains in that too. It's like he can't stop himself, even in, in a different countries, finding the trains there. And here he is at the train station, the noodle bar. We get a sense of sort of the different spaces um, that he lives in towards the end of the film, but you know, and it, it's a tough space, right? It's, it's definitely not the life he wants to be living. Uh, but what we get at the end is this beautiful moment where um, the, the grandmother, the mother has sort of tricked them into all staying the night. There's a storm coming up, right? The, the after the storm, uh, titular storm. And you know, he remembers a time that, um, speaking of, of tight spaces, that his father, who now has passed at the beginning of the film, took him into this playground when, every, when they thought everyone was asleep in the apartment, which of course is probably impossible because the place is so small, he's just misremembering. And so he comes with his little flashlight uh, to get his son and they go into this little playground um, and they get into this, the tightest space, this kind of like little shell and they reconnect for a night. Um, and, you know, they're having snacks, they're talking about school uh, and then the, and then the ex-wife comes in, right? She, she's concerned about the storm, but she kind of gets herself in there. But what's so interesting about Corrieta is that this moment isn't a rekindling. Um, you can imagine a different filmmaker be like, ah, the playground, this is where it's all gonna come back. The, the sparks rekindle, they're so close, everybody's together. And it's not, it's not like a dark thing. It's not a, a twist. It's not some kind of very cynical take. It's just uh, in this moment, A. Proshi's character realizes yeah, I, I need to make some changes, and until I do, um, we're gonna be we're gonna be in different spaces. Uh, but they have this night together too, and it's brought together by space. And they have this moment here, uh, the three of them. I think that's a very creative thing. He's a realist. His dramas are like that. They have these kind of twists, right? Uh, separated at birth kind of stuff. Oh, look, a sister came out of nowhere. But he's also not going to be a sentimentalist. He, you know, created often tells these stories that feel very realistic. And it's partly by plot. Um, he's, he's telling stories about people that don't have to have everything resolved at the end. Um, and we sort of have just visited their lives for two hours. And this is sort of uh, outside. And, and so you have some context there.
but what brings us together, right? So maybe at the end of the film, we don't come together and have a kumbaya moment because that's not what uh, Koryeda is about. What we do have is food and we have walking. And these are the final motifs, right, for the authorship. You're always gonna have food in a Koryeda film. And in this film, what I love is that they're making it together in this very intimate space. And you see um, A. Paroshi's character cutting, uh, uh, and then he's taking a break and he's like tossing some green peas in, um, and they're sort of getting, getting ready for the meal. And we'll see later on, um, there he is sort of cutting up, his son's cutting up some uh, little mushroom and cooking the noodles. And then she's doing some cooking in the microwave, right? The act of cooking um, is a binding agent in many of his films, right? It doesn't matter that the status of the family, like is it a traditionally bound family? Or are they sort of uh, struggling with those connections? Food brings them together um, as much as maybe working through the ashes of the, um, of the incense candle, he's sort of picking out the little incense uh, uh, burners. Um, you know, moments like this where we have this brief moment where the grandmother gets to talk to her grandson uh, about what makes him special and the fact that his calligraphy is a lot like her husband's, his grandfather's. Uh, and, and then in the way that he's about to sell this inkstone, but he realizes, you know, potentially, I need to hold on to this. And so we have this idea in creative films that even when things aren't perfect, we still have these actions from cooking to sort of paying homage to the past, to sharing art, to creating art that bind us, uh, to sort of stacking very elegantly. I just love this shot, our bowls, even, you know, something mundane like doing the dishes is always gonna be a beautiful moment with creative. And, you know, I'm not gonna be pulling this one, this last one out um, on my own. There's a recent Atlantic piece talking about, you know, how there is so much walking. And, and I'll, I'll add this, walking away from the camera um, at times in a creative film. So this is sort of uh, A. Piroshi walking with his son towards the apartment. And um, this is one of the last shots of the film, right? So I, I already showed you the first and here we have the last and they're walking together. Um, he, you know, A. Piroshi's character recognizes um, you know, hopefully we can see each other every month, but I need to make some changes. This is after the storm, after the cleansing, after the catharsis. But what I think is so interesting about this last moment, you know, a lot of Koreeda's films um, end with walking. Uh, they sort of end with walking away from the audience or walking towards something. In this last moment, what's rare about this film is that they look up and especially the grandson, of course, for the passing of the generation, they all look up and they see uh, the grandmother, right? And I think what's great about Corrieta is that for, for the family melodrama, for you know, the artistic splendor, this, this idea you know, from uh, culture, from just his experience, from uh, the type of films that he's been making, that we may be walking, uh, we may be walking away from something as we try to progress, but we're always aware of sort of what we're leaving behind or what is behind us pushing us forward. Uh, and I think it's a, a beautiful touch that is a little bit different from some of those other films. So folks, that's talking about After the Storm. Um, I will note that uh, we have a season finale coming up and frankly, you know, Alex and I have been talking, this has been a very successful year. Uh, we designed this uh, course, we designed this program, you know, in August of last year in, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, you know, my, my course at CCC had to be put on hiatus and, and Alex, of course, needed, uh, you know, to interact with his, um, in his, his, his population, his community. Population sounds so uh, scientific and strange, Alex. Uh, his community in Penyan. And so we put this program together. Um, you know, this may be the season finale. This may be the series finale coming up because obviously the dynamics are changing and we can do different kind of f f uh, film programming next fall. Uh, either way, we're going to be taking the summer off, but before we get there, we're going to be doing one more in June. The last Friday in June, we're going to be talking about a comedy, uh, Hunt for the Wilder People by Taika Waititi. Uh, potentially, you've seen his more well-known films um, like Thor Ragnarok, Thor 3, and maybe you saw the season finale to The Mandalorian um, on Disney+. Plus. He did the final episode to the first season. It was really great. Um, but we're going to talk about this great film. It's very charming. It's very funny. Um, and we'll also sort of have this question. I'm going to kind of break down this question of like, if you're an independent filmmaker, how do you make the leap um, to the big screen? 
right, to the big budget films. Uh, what, what do you need to do in a smaller indie to get noticed? Uh, I really noticed this trend over the past seven years or five years. A lot of independent filmmakers are making the leap to big budget films. I think Taika Waititi is probably the most successful. And I think Hunt for the Wilder People is definitely his like calling card film. It's a great film on its own. Uh, we'll talk about those elements, but I also think you know, if, if you're an aspiring filmmaker, uh, you look at this movie, you're like, I see, okay, there's like four things I need to be doing that Taika Waititi does um, that probably helped him get noticed by big budget uh, companies. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Fantastic, Mike. Thank you for, for that. Very insightful as always. And, uh, and yeah, you are, uh, uh, your words about how the dynamics are changing are absolutely right. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about it uh, at Understanding Film Endgame next month. Uh, but uh, it is, we are very grateful yeah. to had you for the time we've had during all of this. And, uh, and maybe we can do something uh, in live and in person someday again, but uh, we'll, we'll see what, what comes. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, uh, that being said, does anybody out there have any questions or comments about uh, After the Storm before we say goodnight? Well, I, I do. I know that uh, the Japanese films are all small like that. Uh, they just are, uh, every film I've seen, mm -hmm. the interiors are compact. Um, they just don't have a lot of space in Japan. I just was wondering, how do you film that mm -hmm. in those very tiny spaces? Mm -hmm. Does, is there any indication how they, the kind of cameras they use? Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a vast majority are going to be in these kind of like apartment blocks. Again, you know, Creator sometimes dwells on these larger spaces that still exist, um, but a lot of it is small. And I think, uh, and he's sort of really digging into that in a lot of different stories. Um, some like this working class, some sort of like um, more wealthy, like and like father, like son, again, a smaller apartment. Uh, you know, he's probably, I don't know exactly the cameras, but I know that, um, you know, Corieta, for one thing, uh, is now currently using drones. So if you watch uh, The Third Man, his murder mystery, you see a lot of very specific drone footage. And, and a drone can, of course, help you get around spaces uh, in different ways now. Uh, but I would assume he's probably using, you know, a medium-sized digital camera uh, these days. I've noticed uh, the last three films have that particular patina. Um, he's probably using, you know, to get very technical, a red uh, camera is a very specific type. It's very popular. Steven Soderbergh pioneered the red. Um, and it gives you that kind of patina also. Like you can tell uh, a film has that look. Um, you know, it's a little bit more lush than some of the more high-end, um, you know, studio cameras, more of an artistic camera, the red uh, digital camera. So it's probably like a medium size, it's not going to be a handheld, but it'll be something a little bit larger uh, for the steady shots as well. Uh, and of course, he's still using drones, uh, you know, to this day. I noticed some good drone shots in this French film too. Um, just sort of, just the lightness, right? So this is an added quality that you don't get in After the Storm because it's uh, 2014, 2016. But with drones now, he sort of has this elegant floating quality to many of his films. Um, not like there's a ghost or something or a bird flying around, but just like slightly off the ground, it slightly, you know, dips and moves elegantly the camera um, that that's clearly, you know, a drone. He's, he's using those quite effectively now. Um, but in this, he probably just had a medium sized camera he just placed in the corner. Well, if I can add something to that too, we're so used to in American and other films of them often shooting in tiny spaces, but mm -hmm. actually they're sets. And so yes. you see somebody standing near a wall mm -hmm. just talking to somebody. You see the back of one, the front of the other. And then you see it from the shoulder of the other person. Well, the shoulder is one, one foot away from the wall. Right. And you know that, that wall then has been removed. And that person that is actually not in a real house is in a studio. Uh, because there's no way to suddenly, or when they're looking at a mirror, and then suddenly you see it from inside the mirror. Hello, that means that there's a, there's a back to the medicine cabinet, they're shooting it from the next room. Right. So he's avoiding any of that, that, that sort of fictive small space by really using real small spaces. Mm -hmm. And so then that makes it a lot more challenging than the way we sort of cheat in American movies, where it uh, looks small, but uh, it's not, because it's, uh, it's a, uh, a set that they can shift, shift the walls around, and they can move uh, position that way, which when you think about it, you realize 
yeah, he couldn't be behind his shoulder because that's a solid wall. Right. Right. He's doing the real yep. thing. And Koreeda has his roots in very low budget indie films. So now he has this very particular polished look and, and sort of a stately manner to his work. Um, but his first three films, uh, which I saw a long time ago uh, at UB when I was uh, getting my master's there, Koreeda was just hitting the scene. Um, Nobody Knows was his first landmark film about some young children who are abandoned in their apartment. So a very cheery family tale there, uh, but shot on location. Uh, and also his, his really kind of really out there film that I think got um, even more awareness was called Afterlife. And I see Criterion's about to release this, but Afterlife was about, you know, when you go, when you pass, you go up to heaven and there's a film studio up in heaven and they film like with just, just the simplest of props. It's like a, a low budget film studio. So they're all, all these angels and they're just dressed as normal people, but all these angels are like scrapping together whatever they can to create your five minutes that you're gonna live in for eternity. Like what's the memory that they're gonna give you? A happy memory, hopefully. Um, and so, but it, it, it's, it's meant to look like a low budget film set. And he sort of continued this aesthetic of like rugged, you know, low budget, even though now his films look so beautiful. Um, and clearly, you know, the drones aren't cheap, but um, you know, this idea that you can do amazing things with a little. And of course, that also transcends into his characters, so. Yeah, here's um, something else about, about small small spaces. Yeah. Remember some years ago, you showed us a film uh, that was about, uh, what was it, a person who went into somebody else's house and was living in there secretly. Uh, Three Iron, the yeah, Korean yeah. film. Yeah, Korean film. And there, yes. it was also limited space that he managed to slither in and out of various parts. Yeah. So would that have been a set? Would that have been a real, real, real apartment? Yeah. Because uh, I remember it also had a slightly claustrophobic form. I don't yeah. know, does his, does his film seem claustrophobic to you or is it just tight? Yeah, that's a good point. So Three Irons, a film you're thinking of, I, I, you, you always remember that one. Um, I don't, I haven't seen it in many years. I think, you know, we saw it like 10 years ago. That one is meant to be a thriller. It's meant to be sort of like an identity swap thriller. What's, you know, it's a good word though. I, I, what's interesting about Corrieta is even though not only are the tight spaces tight, but a lot of characters like here and in Shoplifters are dealing with economic deprivation of some sort, working class or in poverty like in Shoplifters, it doesn't feel claustrophobic. And it's something about, I think, so the relationship between the people, these uh, either sort of traditional families or quote unquote non-traditional families that provides sort of the life and the energy. Um, you know, even in a tiny playground, like bubble container, you, you don't feel that because the people, you know, love each other or are trying to connect. I think it's an interesting touch that Korea uh, has because, yeah, now that you mention it, um, his films don't seem claustrophobic, even though we're often in these tiny, tiny places. Yeah. Gretchen, have you, have you seen this film? I'm curious. Uh, yes, I did. I watched it uh, earlier today. I wanted to watch it, you know, uh, before this, so it was fresh in my mind. Wonderful. What did you think? Um, I thought it was really good. And it, what's, it's really interesting because I actually watched um, a movie and like read a story that were, that kind of like feel like they tie into the themes mm. uh, just recently. One of them was um, The Farewell. Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, kind of deals with, like, letting go, uh, mm -hmm. specifically with, like, family, and even, like, the thing where there's, you know, that the shots of, like, food and kind of how that brings people together, and there's also um, this really uh, good story um, by um, Jumpy Lahari, mm -hmm. and Lahiri, I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, it's called A Temporary Matter, and it's mm -hmm. um, kind of the story where these two people are trying to, like, their marriage is falling apart, but it's kind of like at the end, they realize they can't fix it. Um, but it's still like a very quiet affair. Like it's not a big thing. And th that's kind of what this reminded me of when I was mm -hmm. watching it. Like, even though it's kind of like, you know, there, there's still like something kind of monumental happening. It's very quiet and kind of, um, it, it, it's not, not like a big revelation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's quite a, a beautiful spectrum of the AAPI community that you've been interacting with there, Gretchen, um, from South Asia over to uh, East Asia. And I have read uh, that short story many years ago. It's a, it's a great one. I think it's the only one I've read by that author, unfortunately. Um, and The Farewell is interesting because in The Farewell by Lulu Wang with Aquafina, um, that one's set in China and you have, you know, Aquafina has been living in the United States for a long time. And so there's kind of this push and pull dynamic in that film. 
And I'm curious to see where Lulu Wang goes, because I know my students at Ithaca, uh, many of whom are in the AAPI community or are from China or have uh, you know, relations with uh, the Chinese community, um, feel that, that tension. Um, and talk about when they write about the film, that tension of sort of being pushed and pulled in both directions. What's interesting about Corrieta is sort of this gravitational pull of the situation. Um, you know, even if they're not doing the right things in Corrieta films, they're still being sort of pulled in to this gravity, the center of the family, whatever that is. Um, whereas Lulu Wang, I think, does such a great job in The Farewell of sort of that, that contradiction. Uh, Aquafina is kind of stuck in. Um, and so those are, those are great picks in terms of the family dynamics you thought about there. Yeah. Great. I have to review that, that short story too. Diane, what do you, what do you think? I, I know you've been watching these carefully, subtitles and all. Well, you have to, cause you have to watch all the, you know, that's right. So you have to pay attention. Uh, I, I have to say I fixated an awful lot on father. <laughs> he, yeah. he was a frustrating character because mm -hmm. you really wanted him to to fix what was wrong with them you know the gambling and and the the false pride you know he's offered that draw a job which is supposed to give it get him a lot of money yeah. at the manga place uh but you know the pride just won't let him stoop to that he sees it instead of it's writing you're writing you're writing you're writing whether it's this form or that form <clears throat> to him uh he's the novelist and uh he sees himself up on a pedestal to some degree and all it does is serve him to uh, sort of stumble. And you know, he steals through the mother and uh, he's conniving. And uh, you know, instead of keeping the money so that he can pay the ex-wife and, and put things on an even keel so she can respect him a little bit, want him to be spending more time with the son. Um, you know, he just can't get over the hump of that addiction and of his own, his own uh, weaknesses and partly you want to just give him a kick in the rear end come on you can do this yeah. partly you feel sorry for him and in the end as you say it's for the best that she has you know there's no sentiment sentimentality there at the end in a very quiet way she says you know he's not going to change that he, he yeah. can't keep those promises uh this is what he is until there's some big breakthrough on his part so uh you know, it's like everybody accepts this quiet little, you know, situation for themselves. Even the little boy, he just seems so very, you know, like kids sometimes see more than the adults do. And right. he just seems kind of resigned. Uh, he doesn't necessarily love this new guy in his, his uh, mother's life, even though he could be more stable. Uh, but at the same time, he just kind of accepts it. And it's kind of sad. Uh, so I felt a lot of frustration with that guy. You just want to give him a good kick in the rear end once in a while. And I, I wonder too, I mean, there's so much uh, seemingly unresolved, but when he says towards the end of the film, you know, I, I know, I know now. I wonder, you know, with Corey, there's often these kind of like, it's not what we wanted. It's not what we necessarily expected to have him. We want him to just sort of fix everything and be like, I'm not going to gamble anymore but potentially just saying, okay, I get it now. I understand, you know, is that the first step? Is it something else? Um, is it just a, a different type of resignation? Uh, you know, those moments sneak up on you with his films, um, oftentimes with the male characters too, with the men, with the fathers that have to kind of come to terms with something as, you know, the women often are the ones that are kind of holding things together, uh, which is a motif in his films too, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Nancy, have you seen the film? Just curious. Yeah, I actually watched it twice this week. Wow, awesome. Yeah, I really liked it. I watched just, it a few days ago and then again today to get ready for tonight. <laughs> it was very good. Um, mm -hmm. I really liked what you said, I think in the beginning, I, I can't remember your exact wording, but just um, the closeness of the space compared to the greatness of their emotions. Like I was really, and it just summed it up, like that was so succinct. Because I think I was feeling that, and to have you like verbalize it, that was like really good. Because um, the close-ups, the close-ups uh, of the camera, you know, I guess that created to like the feeling of the crampness and the confinement of the space, but it also uh, illustrated their emotions to such a degree. 
Um, and there was, it just, there were a lot of points, but um, on the, was it in the slides or the bed? It was in the bedroom when they were having that conversation, the wife and he, and um, he said something about things not, oh, I can't remember exactly. I should have wrote it down but something along the lines that his feelings weren't going to change. And he meant like, well, I don't know if he meant it, but he said, well, I'm always going to be his father. But uh, I think he meant much more than that. And it, to me, like her expression when he said that, it almost seemed like very hopeful. Like she thought she wanted to hear him say more, like maybe that was a point where he would make a decision to change or something. But she clearly, you know, had some feelings for him and maybe she was hoping, you know, he was gonna change or do better. But, and then right away, you know, she's like, no, you know, I've made a decision to, you know, move forward. So I just, there were a lot of points like that, the close ups with, you know, between he, like on the slide with the three of them there. And I think he was, he might have been crying, you know, when he realized, you know, things weren't going to change. But yeah, I liked it. It was very, very good. That's that's wonderful, Nancy. And, and thank you so much for that, that extra beautiful scene for sure. Um, uh, and you know, was it tears? Was it the rain? Was it a medley of the two? I thought about that too. Um, you know, like father, like son, for instance, for those Nancy potentially, uh, and everybody is on Hulu right now by subscription. I mean, I'm paying like $2 a month on Hulu. I don't know if you can get a deal like that. You could, well, certainly subscribe for free for seven days and then drop it. Um, but I think that's, you know, like father, like son is probably his most well known before shoplifter as it was the one that really put him on the international map. Um, so I would take a look at that. Um, and also with the sort of the swapped at birth plot conceit is sort of one of his more, um, you know, emotionally challenging because you're like, you can see that the children are, are in some ways happier with different uh, parents and the, but the, the, the government sort of like, we could, we could swap them back if you want, that is the law. And so he has that great dynamic there. And just, you know, thinking through the scene that you mentioned too, Nancy, um, just, I don't know how, how he does it that the characters, the performances have so much detail um intonations little gestures i mean i watch a lot of films set in japan uh of today and, and there's just something about the way koreata gets you know the just the use of the mouth or the way that you pronounce the words seems slightly different in a creative film like tarantino frankly does the same thing with the english language um too so it's just uh, uh yeah yeah that's 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 a great um final point to be to be bringing up there i appreciate that yeah. uh all right. I think um, if we don't have any final thoughts, though, uh, that we want to put on the table, Alex, do you want to wrap things up here? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I also just want to uh, draw attention back to the fact you raised a couple of points ago that uh, this has been AAPI Heritage Month, uh, Asian American Pacific Island Heritage Month. Um, and I know a lot of the movies you select come from that part of the world. Um, uh, it's something, you know, a, a culture and a heritage that uh, we celebrate, not just one month out of the year, but all year round, hopefully. Um, but it was uh, great to dig into this movie this month in particular and to talk about some of those uh, particularities of Coriada's uh, auteurism um, and how that relates to the, to the wider uh, Asian film scene. So thank you for bringing that to us this month in particular. Um, and you know, I'm really looking forward to talking about uh, Taika Watiti next month. So I hope you will all join us. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight, everybody, and for sharing your thoughts. And thank you, Mike, as always. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. We see this great uh, also message from Alejandra Molina, who, uh, who came in. I, it looks like she stepped away. Well, there um, you go. I really appreciate her, her thoughts there as well. So um, thanks, everybody, and have a great night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.